Well, welcome to our third Friends Talk this year. It has only been a short while since we looked back over the Apollo Moon program and noted how relatively little had been achieved since. Things could now be changing, and Professor Anand is the right person to be telling us about this, given his current research activities at the Open University. You will have read his biographical notes on the website. I should just add that Professor Anand has been RAS Vice President of Geophysics since 2019, and to remind you that geophysics extends its reach to all parts of the solar system. His commitment to lunar studies is exemplified by a polo shirt inscription, Living on the Moon, an image we had to forego for space reasons only. Now, Professor Anand will talk for 45 minutes, then answer questions. Please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screens at any time. Finally, just to remind you that this talk will be available later via a dedicated YouTube channel. And now a warm welcome to Mahesh Amend. Thank you very much, uh, Marcus. Uh, am I coming loud and clear? Yep, I can hear you well. Okay, thank you very much. So thanks once again for uh, inviting me to share some of my research uh, with the friends of the RAS. And of course, I'm doubly delighted because as you mentioned, I'm coming to the end of my two year term as a RAS Vice President Geophysics. And if it was not for the pandemic, I probably would have had the pleasure of meeting many of the friends who are actually in this uh, Zoom webinar. Uh, but I remain hopeful that uh, in the coming months, we shall return to those uh, usual in-person events at Burlington House. So um, today uh, I'm here to talk to you about really what has happened in the last 10 years or so with regards to lunar exploration. Um, and as Marcus mentioned in his introduction, although it's only a short while ago, it still it, is, it has been 50 years uh, since uh, the Apollo 11 actually landed on the moon and brought some samples back to the earth. So 50 years you know, can be quite a significant period of time to actually unravel lots of uh, mysteries of any planetary body. But for the moon, it seems like the mysteries, they just uh, keep uh, increasing. And, and that's what we found out in the last decade or so. And I think now we are on a quest that requires another 50 years at least before we can say that we have actually addressed many of those issues. So hopefully through this talk, I can convey to you some of the excitement uh, that is out there, uh, both from science point of view, but also from exploration point of view. Um, and I'm pretty sure that uh, most of you keep hearing um, uh, various uh, news items, uh, various articles about how the entire world at, at now is trying to vie for the moon. Um, and I don't know how many of you actually witnessed the fantastic uh, full moon a couple of days ago. Um, we were very fortunate in the southeast of uh, England that actually the sky was very clear and it was just absolutely fabulous to see the uh, one of the so-called super moons of uh, hmm. this year. So before I go into my talk, I, I just wanted to point out um, that, you know, I'm based at the Open University and uh, I've been here for 15 years. And about two years ago, three years ago, when we were about to celebrate our uh, 50th anniversary, uh, I kind of noticed this coincidence that uh, while we were actually going to celebrate the 50th anniversary of getting a charter for our university. It was coinciding in the same year when the Apollo landing, Apollo 11 landing took place. So, you know, for me, uh, I couldn't have been at a better place at a remarkable institution such as the Open University, which, you know, has reached out to uh, millions of learners all around the world. And here I am at the same time actually um, working on the moon rocks that were collected by uh, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin. And I thought I was the, the luckiest uh, 
person there. So I, I hope that uh, you 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 will feel my excitement um, and and the real you know uh, feeling that how privileged I am to be working on some of those moon rocks at the Open University in Milton Keynes. That's where uh, our labs are based. Um, if you haven't been to uh, the OU in Milton Keynes, then this is our building. That's where we do our space research. Um, we have about 100 roundabout research activist staff, uh, a, a good community of postgraduate research students. Um, and our space research is sort of broadly um, divided into three groups, uh, astronomy, space instrumentation, and of course, planetary and space sciences, to which I belong. Um, OU has had a very rich history of actually being involved in space exploration during its 50 years of existence. And, and again, you know, the, 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 this should not be a surprise because I'm uh, quite sure that everybody here would have uh, uh, heard or at least followed some of these missions, at least when they were happening right. Um, in their final stages, such as Rosetta mission, the Cassini-Huygens uh, mission, and of course, a part of ExoMars, which is still ongoing. And these are just a few examples where actually the OU has had a major involvement, um, both from actually developing and uh, building space instruments that have been flown on these space missions, but also down the line, actually partaking in the uh, reduction and the interpretation of the data for scientific um, advancement. So, so this keeps us quite busy. And as the space missions go, they always take a few decades to, to uh, come to fruition. So, you know, we age with the space missions and uh, it's always nice to see when a space mission finally uh, succeeds, which in the case of Rosetta mission, uh, for my colleagues. This happened before I joined the OU, the whole uh, mission involvement, but they have been working on Rosetta mission for over 25 years. So I could see the tears in their eyes when actually the Rosetta mission did get into orbit around the comet uh, for a little while. And then the um, uh, Philae lander, which actually had our major involvement from the OU eventually landed on, on the comet. And we hope the same will come true for uh, uh, the ExoMars rover that will hopefully be launched next year and will land on Mars in, in a few months time. And so while these space missions are ongoing and we have a spacecraft uh, moving to its target, we also do uh, laboratory-based research and that's where I'm mostly uh, active in. So at the OU in Milton Keynes, we have some of the best uh, analytical laboratories involved in uh, doing research on uh, extraterrestrial samples. And here are some images of those. Uh, and we are very uh, proud of uh, having developed many of these facilities from scratch. So these are not off the shelf machines. So for example, on the extreme left, you see an image of one of my colleagues who over the past 30 years has actually built one of the most complicated instrument of its type in the world that is known for its analysis of carbon, nitrogen, and various noble gases simultaneously. And, and in the middle, you see an image of our flagship instrument that we have. This is off the shelf. This is provided by a commercial company. So um, we, we use this machine, it's called NanoSims, which is what we have been using to actually detect and quantify uh, water in lunar samples, which is what I will be talking to you about. And, and much of this work has been initiated and uh, uh, done by uh, my group uh, in the last 10 years. Uh, just to give you a flavor of where we are. So the research that we have been involved in um, often uh, catches uh, headlines and uh, one of our recent work I was in the news because we um, demonstrated that some of the samples that were collected by the Apollo 17 mission, the very last of the Apollo missions uh, that uh, humans uh, uh, returned some samples from, 
um, indicated that at the moon, actually, there are some very large scale processes that have gone on that had not been identified up until this research. So that was a good uh, news story, but it's just an example of the sort of things that um, we, we are involved in. Uh, and as I mentioned, we have a very strong heritage in the analysis of samples, especially the return samples. So many of you would have known our um, ex-professor who is no longer with us, Professor Colin Pillinger. He was involved in the very early days of the Apollo program. And I kind of, you know, uh, had the baton passed from him to now then continue forward with lots of other colleagues around me uh, involved in various sample return missions. Um, and, and none of this would be possible without the university actually invest, investing in the state of the art laboratory infrastructure, which is expensive, but I think that is something that the OU has decided to support and uh, for which of course we are very uh, grateful. Um, and we have a very longer term involvement with various space agencies program, whether it's NASA, whether it's um, uh, Roscosmos, and more recently with the newer space agencies such as Indian Space Research Organization, Chinese um, uh, Space Agency, et cetera. Um, and in the middle uh, bottom, what you see are images of um, a core uh, that was collected by the Apollo 17, and that had been kept pristine up until two years ago when it was finally open. And now there is a very large international consortium that is actually looking at uh, these lunar samples from this core and trying to actually address some of the big questions that have arisen in the last 10 years. And, and this goes on to show that, you know, how careful curation of material returned even 50 years ago could actually reap dividend when you have the technologies that have actually improved and have um, become much better. And you have actually found, um, you know, you've made new discoveries and you want to now address some of those outstanding questions, but you can't immediately go back to the moon. So you can use this core to, to do some of those measurements. So I'm sure that in the next few years, there will be many more discoveries that will come out from this work. Uh, my work, even though um, today what I'm talking about is focused on lunar samples that were returned by the Apollo astronauts, um, there is a wider context there that in order for us to understand properly, um, you know, how the solar system works, how it came about, its origin and evolution, we have to have material from those um, bodies. Um, whether it is Mars, whether it is uh, Venus or asteroids or whatever it is. And, and very recently I finished editing this book, uh, which is uh, called Role of Sample Return in Addressing Science Questions. Um, and it coincided with these two missions that have recently actually brought samples from other world bodies. So on the top right, you see an image of the capsule uh, that was uh, that, that, that is being retrieved in Australia, uh, which the Japanese Hayabusa 2 mission returned uh, from an asteroid. And at the bottom right is the much bigger capsule that actually returned uh, lunar samples in uh, last December by the Chinese Space Agency. And, and while I am talking to you, there is yet another mission called OSIRIS-REx that is NASA's mission that is on its way back to the earth after having collected some asteroid and material. So this coming decade is going to be defined by some of these um, return sample research. Uh, and so in a way it's kind of once again after 50 years since Apollo, this might be a golden age of sample science. But let's uh, return our attention to the moon, why uh, is it is still important to explore the moon and to uh, do the scientific research uh, on, on moon rocks in, in their own right. So we should always consider moon as part of the earth in the sense that it is part of the earth moon system. And actually 
if I had time and um, we were discussing how the moon itself might have played a big role in how the earth came about and might even have significance in you know, maintaining the habitability on earth. We are not discussing that today, but that is yet another aspect of this moon being part of earth moon system. But for lunar exploration, the important thing is that it's relatively near to us, um, you know, a mere three days travel time um, that they took the Apollo um, astronauts to get to the moon. And uh, in, you know, three days to come back. So all together, you know, within a week, you could actually do a round trip with some uh, field work, which is what the Apollo astronauts did. And that's pretty relatively insignificant amount of time compared to how long it takes to even get to the nearest destination. You know, if you want to go to Mars, it still takes approximately six months to get there one way. So, so the moon is being used not just as, you know, a, a body in itself, which is telling us much about the solar system history, but also it is being used as an enabler where you can test the technologies, whether you can actually test some of the things that you want to eventually take to Mars, but you can't take the risk of actually going there without testing it. And that's where the moon is playing a huge role. So just looking back uh, over 50 years, nothing happens in a day. And certainly in space exploration, nothing happens even in a decade. So it's a multi-decadal uh, process. And that's best illustrated by the image on the left, where you see a number of rockets that uh, were developed, tested, et cetera, ultimately leading to the development of Saturn V, which actually took the Apollo astronauts uh, to, to, to the moon. And indeed, you know, none of this would have ha happened without the contribution of hundreds of thousands of people, perhaps, I don't know, even in million, uh, who were unnoticed because they were always in the background. And this particular movie, if any of you have actually come across this one, brings out that one aspect of it, that how people from a diverse background actually played key role in making the Apollo uh, the success that it was. And, and of course, we all see this picture you know, more often uh, where uh, the three Apollo 11 astronauts uh, were all over the place because they were the one who actually uh, took the risk and uh, left the earth and went, went to the moon as being the first human beings on any other celestial body. And all of this required a lot of courage and determination. Um, but at the same time, space exploration is something that actually I think brings everyone together. And for once makes people at least momentarily forget that actually there are, uh, we have put artificial boundaries within our um, homes or um, uh, countries, whatever we want to call them. And, and that's why to, to me, space exploration uh, has got a particular attraction to it because that's where you can rise, uh, hopefully you can rise above politics. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, th this picture when astronauts uh, on Apollo 8, who went around the moon in December 1968, when they come out from the far side of the moon and they suddenly saw the earth rising in a distance, that's when I think uh, it made them realize that how fortunate we are to be living on this world. And then this picture became very famous, obviously. Um, and, and, and most people on earth when actually uh, they take some time to reflect on it and, and, and think what they are looking at. They probably start to value their place in the, um, in, in, in the universe. So this is probably one of the most spectacular images that has ever been captured from, from space. And of course, now 50 years on, we have got uh, much better uh, cameras. We have got um, better, um, you know, ways of doing exploration using spacecraft, etc. So this is just a composite image that has been put together by a number of images captured by NASA's uh, most recent lunar mission, which is still in orbit called Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. And you, the picture is taken as if you are actually behind the far side of the moon and looking towards the Earth. I mean, it's a view that we from the earth would never see it because we never see the far side of the moon. Um, but this brings out the, uh, 
the relative size, the, the, the also view of how the earth and the far side might look like if somebody had a vantage point from behind uh, the moon. Now, maybe I, I'm, I'm just repeating this. Most of you obviously um, are friends of RAS. So as I was telling Marcus the other day that actually I find that most people know about the moon much more than I do. So um, forgive me if I am actually uh, telling you something that you already know, but you know, during just before the Apollo times when there was competition going on between the Soviet Union and, 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 and the United States, nobody really knew how the far side looked like. And on the right, you see the very first picture that the Luna 3 actually uh, sent back in 1959. So, um, 60, uh, 62 years ago almost, um, uh, it's very pixelated, but it was obvious by this picture that actually the two sides of the moon are not the same. And, and that has a quite a big scientific significance, which we are still trying to understand why is that? And to anybody who actually doesn't need to know about the moon, if they saw this picture, and I will make this picture a bit better, this is a more recent picture is that you can see that is a dichotomy that what we see from, from the earth, which is known as the near side of the moon, has much more these dark patches, which are made up of big, vast expanses of lava flows. Um, you know, whereas on the far side, that's very little. Most of the far side looks actually pretty homogeneous uh, and much more brighter which actually reflects the um, material that makes up the lunar crust uh, and, and makes up highlands uh, known as the lunar highlands. Whereas on the near side, you do have lunar highlands, but right in the middle, you have got these depressions which are filled by lava flows uh, appearing as dark patches. And these are the areas that actually the Apollo astronauts visited. So now you imagine because during the Apollo time, we didn't have a full picture of what the near side and the far side looked like. We just visited those areas that could be safely visited without risking the lives of the astronaut. And we just collected samples from some anomalous region, so to speak, brought back to earth and then developed for the next 50 years, the science of the moon based on that. And now we are finding out that perhaps our understanding is uh, com incomplete. And, and that's why now there are plans to actually return to the moon and go to the regions that actually weren't visited by the Apollo astronauts. And interestingly, if you look at the Chang'e 5, which I mentioned to you, uh, brought back samples last December, it is still went to the, the same darker region, even though a bit further away towards the very Northwest corner of the near side, it did not actually go and sample an area where um, you know, we don't have any, any samples from. And even though Chang'e 4 is the only mission that has landed on the far side of the moon, which you see on the right uh, image, uh, it is just a lander with a rover. It's not returning any samples. So hopefully based on the remote sensing data that this mission would provide, the future missions can be planned to actually go to this area. And, and Chang'e 4 is actually sitting in an area which is called South Pole Aitken uh, Basin. In short, it's known as SBA. Uh, and you can just see a faint uh, feature around Chang'e 4 that looks a bit darker than the rest of the far side. And, and it's a huge basin about 2,500 kilometer in diameter that is believed to have formed right at the beginning of the solar system formation, which is around four and a half billion years ago. So there is a significant interest in actually collecting material to better understand the formation of the South Politkin Basin. And if it's 2,500 kilometer in diameter, the impact that would have actually created it most certainly would have also affected the earth. So by understanding how the SPA formed, we might even understand what was going on on, on the earth because the moon is part of the earth moon system. And, and some of these, uh, you know, the, this particular image is simply bringing out the uh, variation in relief or topography that you have at the lunar surface. And altogether, you know, the difference in relief is 
of the order of you know 12 to 14 kilometers which is uh you know one and a half times of the entire height of the mount everest so the moon has some of the you know big mountains and some of the big depressions so again geologically it is very interesting uh place to 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 do field work and that's what i think during the later half of Apollo missions, the Apollo 15 to 17, um, astronauts actually did much more geological field work on the moon compared to the first three mission astronaut. And this just shows that it looks, looks very busy and it seems like the moon has been actually visited many, many times and therefore we shouldn't bother about it. I think all this shows is that how, despite moon being so near, despite visiting moon so many times, how poor is our understanding of our nearest neighbor? And this will become obvious as I go uh, uh, further. So, so this, is, this is where my work comes in. So I work on samples that have been returned by uh, six Apollo uh, missions. Uh, and in addition, there were three Soviet lunar missions that returned about 300 gram or 0.3 kilograms of moon rocks versus 382 kilograms of Apollo moon rocks. And then recently, uh, this sample set has been complemented by the Chang'e 5 mission that collected about 1.7 kilograms of soil samples. And um, I was supposed to visit China uh, this year to work with colleagues on these samples, but because of the pandemic, I haven't been able to make the trip. So let's see when I get the opportunity. Um, but in addition to these return samples, we also have lots of lunar meteorites uh, that naturally fall to Earth from time to time when something impacts on the moon, liberates material that then ends up on the Earth. The only thing we don't know is where they are actually coming from. But they are still interesting in the sense that once you have confirmed that they are from the moon, if they are telling you or showing you some new signature, you are pretty sure that actually they are telling you something more than what the Apollo and the other return samples have uh, told you. So um, what are the key findings actually that came about from having the lunar samples? Because up until we had material from the moon, nobody quite knew what the moon was made up of. There was a lot of speculation uh, ranging from one extreme to the other. But after the analysis of the first Apollo samples, it became quite clear that actually moon was a rocky body uh, that had gone through some uh, very violent geological history. And a new concept arose uh, to, uh, to reconcile all the data that have been collected on the Apollo samples. And it's known as giant impact hypothesis, where a Mars-sized body is believed to have impacted the very early Earth uh, causing a loss of material that actually flung out in space and later on re-accreted to form a satellite of Earth, which is uh, uh, our moon. And, and during the same process, once the material was coalescing to form the moon, the entire moon or most of it actually became a ball of molten lava. And that ball of molten lava slowly cooled down, uh, creating layering, uh, forming a core, although the exact existence and size of core is, is yet un, undetermined, uh, but it, it, it sort of uh, evolved into a layered structure with uh, a mantle and then a crust. And that crust that formed is what we see today as a very bright um, regions, which are called lunar highlands. And then that whole uh, magma of um, uh, ocean was known as lunar magma ocean. And lunar magma ocean has become one of the uh, uh, most useful concept for understanding the evolution of other planets such as even Mars or even our own Earth, uh, because we do not have the evidence for Earth that it went through a magma ocean phase just because of the geological activity on the Earth, we have lost those evidence, but by understanding these things from the moon where things are much, much better preserved because there is no air or water as such as we have on earth to cause the weathering and erosion, that things are actually, you know, 
preserve much better on the moon that we are now beginning to understand that what might have happened on earth and there is this big question of when earth became habitable and that is currently one of the biggest research questions that is being addressed and the moon has an important role to play to, to address that uh, question <coughs> excuse me However, this lunar magma ocean model only came about um, based on the samples that were collected from the near side from those Apollo and lunar missions. So the question remains that, you know, do, does this apply to the far side as well? And if it does, then okay. If it doesn't, then, you know, can we actually test it if you bring the rocks back from the far side and see whether it actually fits within the lunar magma ocean model? or not. And, and that's why the next mission to the moon to return samples is likely to be from the far side. Um, where exactly from is being discussed, um, but uh, it, it, it is going to be far side for sure. Another thing that actually uh, a topic that will play a big role in where we go for the next sample return from the moon is the topic of lunar volatiles. And, as you know, water is a type of volatile. And here I say volatile because it's not just the water, but there are other volatiles such as uh, carbon, nitrogen, and there are a few other elements that can also be considered volatile. We, we can actually use all of them together to better understand the history of the moon. The, the biggest change that has come about in the last decade or so is after the Apollo, missions, when scientists analyzed those rocks and soil samples, they barely found any hint of water. And whatever water they found, they ascribed those to interaction of the samples with the terrestrial atmosphere, because either the storage wasn't great, or even if you have the best of the storage, you still can't avoid certain amount of contamination. And they couldn't distinguish between the two. So they are on the side of caution and say, rather than saying that we found water on the moon, let's see, let's say that's all contamination. It was not until um, 2008 when um, some of the scientists around the world, they started reanalyzing these moon rocks, which um, using better instrumentation with much better sensitivity and not analyzing samples as a bulk sample and instead actually doing in situ measurements where the likelihood of any atmospheric absorbed water, getting into them was minuscule, almost negligible. And, and that was the time when I was also starting out my, uh, my research uh, project uh, in, in various lunar, on lunar samples. And so it is struck to me that I was using the same technique as others uh, were doing for water analysis, but I was using the technique to actually age date the moon rocks. And, and when I went to a conference and where this was being discussed, an idea dawned on me that why don't I actually combine my age dating work with the measurement of water? So not only I will measure the water, but I will also be able to establish has the nature of water or the amount of water changed in the moon over time because I had the tool to actually date it. And that's where my first research project came in called Secular Evolution of Water in the moon. And there I am still 15 years on or 10 years on trying to um, grapple with that problem. So I mostly work with polished rock samples. So here is just an, a microscope image of one of the moon rocks. And what I look for are certain minerals that are known to contain, are they really like holding on to any water that is present in the magma from which this rock has formed? And so it turned out that the same mineral called apatite also likes to host the radioactive element uranium. And of course, you would know that actually uranium being radioactive, it decays. And therefore, using the uranium lead decay scheme, you can calculate the age or the, the age when the system became closed. In these cases, that equates usually to when the rock formed. So the same apatite mineral you are age dating, but at the same time, you are also finding out the water, 
that was present and the nature of water by making the isotopic measurement of that water. And we do the isotopic measurement for um, water by measuring the two isotopes of hydrogen, so hydrogen and deuterium. And it turned out that the deuterium to hydrogen ratio of um, water can be characteristic of where it might have come from. So if it came from comets, if it came from asteroids, if it came from the solar wind as solar hydrogen, it has a very different ratio of deuterium to hydrogen. So it kind of allows us to use it as a fingerprint for constraining the source and the origin of that water. So that's what we did. And of course, uh, other investigators around the world. And so on the left-hand side, you see a piece of work that was done in America at Brown University and, and Carnegie Institution in Washington. On the right is the work that we did at the Open University. And total combined, we demonstrated that the moon actually uh, was much better uh, in terms of water, had uh, thousands, 10,000 times more water than originally thought. And the source of this water are likely to be asteroids. The majority of the water to the moon was delivered by asteroids. And that's why you see the title of our paper on the bottom right, which said an asteroidal origin for water in the moon. Now that doesn't settle uh, uh, anything at all. It just shows that we have made one step in the right direction. But this particular work has then opened up five other you know, avenues for you know, what type of asteroid. And if it is not majority is not asteroid, then what else was there? And we are still researching on some of those things and now actually arriving at uh, identifying other potential contributors all the way to uh, the, the sun itself. So, some of that is not yet in public domain, so we are in the process of publishing it, so you will no doubt hear about it if you are interested in it. Now, in addition to the water that is present inside the moon, which is what the rocks are telling us, there is also evidence that there is water at the surface of the moon. And that actually is more exciting in some sense to those who want to do exploration. So who want to visit the moon to actually harvest the water for various purposes, whether it is for drinking, for astronauts, survival, making breathable oxygen, or even using as a rocket propellant. And actually this is something which has attracted a lot of commercial uh, interest. And, and there is a new area that has arisen called space resources. And much of it actually is predicated on finding uh, substantial quantities of usable water or the components of water at, at, at the moon. And the most obvious place for this water seems to be um, the two poles. So here you see some of the uh, end on views as if you are looking uh, from above or below the lunar poles. And, and those patches that you see in the colors of blue on the left hand image and the, the greens and the reds in the middle are areas where actually a substantial amount of water ice, pure water ice is suspected in deep lunar craters in the lunar polar regions. But these are not very easy to access. It's, uh, it's extremely difficult. The temperature at polar regions could be you know, extremely low, less than minus 150 degrees centigrade or even lower. So, you know, uh, and, and the sun barely reaches there. So that's a lots of technological challenges that are going to be there. But this is what is actually uh, right now driving much of the lunar exploration. Uh, and, and those are not just remote sensing results. There was a, uh, uh, a spent rocket stage that was actually crashed into one of these so-called coal trap uh, regions. And then the plume that rose, um, the, there was various types of uh, spectrometers that were on board another spacecraft that was going at the same time around the moon. It detected um, around two and a half eight percent water. So in, in some ways, this was the, as close you came or we came to directly confirming the presence of water in one polar location at least. 
And if you then extrapolate from that, then you say that the rest of the places that look the same must have water and therefore there must be that much water, et cetera. And that's what is being used right now to, to verify by further means. So where do we go from here? So we go from here, what we have learned. So we have learned lots of lessons from the last 50 years of research. We're very lucky that we have some of the Apollo samples is still preserved in the pristine conditions as they were return and therefore now we can use those to address some of the new questions which is what we are trying to do but i also mentioned to you a new area of research that is arising or opening up called space resources where uh, space agencies commercial entities industry they want to actually go to the moon to um, uh, extract the resources for a sustainable exploration. So you carry the minimum amount from the earth and you derive uh, material from where you are. Uh, and this field is known as in situ resource utilization. In short, you might hear about it, IESRU, and this is on the rise because the overall aim is that to use the lunar exploration as uh, in, you know, in a, a the moon may be in the critical path of exploration of Mars and beyond. And I, I really think that there are lots of synergies for that. And, you know, it is going to be very hard to go direct to Mars, uh, especially with humans, without actually having uh, perfected all the techniques and uh, uh, performed all the tasks that you may wish to perform on Mars, and the moon first. So moon is going to be playing a big role um, still for the next foreseeable future for exploration of other worlds. But there remains much to be explored about the moon itself, which is what is happening with this plan of having a kind of an international space station type of setup around the moon. Some of it is a bit political, so it might or might not happen. But I think the idea is that whether NASA and ESA do it or not, somebody else will. And, and this is only obvious that if you want to explore any place, you've got to develop infrastructure and you have to develop a sustainable exploration program. You can't just do it one off to go and come back. Um, that is what is actually leading to the next initiative of returning humans to the moon. NASA calls his Artemis program. Lots of space agencies have actually signed up to something called Artemis Accord. So things are moving in the uh, in, a, in a direction of where you will see a multilateral approach, uh, lots of uh, government and industry partnership. Uh, you might have heard that very recently. I think it was only last week that NASA actually announced that they are assigning a contract to SpaceX to to land the next astronauts uh, on the moon. So lots of things are happening. Uh, but let's see how things pan out. But eventually, uh, this is what is likely to happen, that humans are going to extend presence uh, to the moon and they have to utilize all the scientific information that we have collected so far, work with the industry and, and then you know use the moon. Um, you have to build your outpost or habitat if you want to explore the climate properly uh, and then if you can find resources then that will allow us to go beyond the moon using the rocket propellant etc and we are playing a small part in that at the open university by doing the science but also developing various bits of space instrumentation utilizing our heritage from previous uh, uh, successful uh, missions to um, to make this instrument for future missions. And here are a couple of examples of where we are involved in. So we are involved with the European Space Agency to build a miniaturized laboratory that is slated to fly on a Russian Luna 27 mission in 2025, 2026. So in uh, four or five years time. In the meantime, we are doing lots of laboratory research to um, assess the potential of lunar resources that are out there. And sometimes BBC likes to pick things up that how we are extracting water on the moon and we just don't do research. We obviously go out and try to excite and engage um, 
the the other stakeholders, the the public, the the, the uh, learners who are out there, and this is just a few images of uh, a Royal Society summer science exhibition that I led is called Living on the Moon. And Marcus mentioned that, and I'm still proudly wearing my t-shirt that we designed for that uh, uh, event. Um, if you were interested in learning more about any of these things, there are lots and lots of information we have. The Open University has a website, it's free um, education material called Open Learn. Uh, you just type Open Learn in Google and you will get to it. A year ago, I worked with one of my colleagues to bring out this book. It's an iBook you can download on your iPad, on your uh, tablet. It's called Moon Minerals and just go through it um, and look through hundreds of polished thin sections under a microscope into a website called Virtual Microscope. And uh, if you still uh, were interested, you can watch this BBC uh, documentary drama called Eight Days to the Moon and Back, which chronicles how Apollo 11 took place from takeoff to landing. So I think I'm a little bit over my time, but I just wanted to share a piece of music with you that I commissioned by working with a Zaz artist, where we put out about two and a half minutes of music to convey three main scientific findings about the moon over the last 50 years. The first is the violent birth of the moon. The second is the discovery of water. And the third is what it may feel like for a human who is actually uh, on the moon by themselves. Uh, and so I'm gonna play that. And just after that, we will take questions if that's okay. And it will be about two minutes long. So hopefully it will work. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
So I hope that uh, you enjoyed it. And um, I just want to finish my talk by uh, acknowledging the huge amount of work that my team um, has done. And of course, it's incomplete because we always have more PhD students coming in and lots of them actually going elsewhere, but uh, it just gives you a snapshot. And of course, none of this would be possible without funding from these organizations. So thanks to them. So I will invite you to ask any questions and I'm happy to stick around for another five, 10 minutes if need be. And I apologize for being over time a bit. Marcus. Yes, well, thank you very much. That was fascinating talk. And um, indeed, we have a question from H.C. Edwards saying, if you could be granted a wish, no budget or political limits to further your research, what would you want or what would be the lunar sample you'd most like? That's, um, that's a great question. And of course, uh, because it's all about my wish, <laughs> you know, I would like to actually get a get a piece of uh, what we call the, a xenolith, which is a piece of on Earth. It would be piece of the Earth's mantle. So I would want something equivalent to the Earth's mantle, it's a lunar mantle, because so far all we have analyzed as the material that has actually um, arisen by secondary processes affecting the interior of the moon. We don't have a piece that we can call this is the inside of the moon, which is what we do on Earth. So, so that would be something, and I think that would settle so many questions about the origin of the moon, you know, and, and just from there on, it's an um, unlimited number of questions that you can address. So that would be my wish. And um, just as a follow up, that if uh, sorry, this is a personal question. Just before we answer the other one, if you did have the opportunity to travel to the moon as you know, as part of a team, would you like to go? Absolutely, any day, any moment. Just give me a chance. <laughs> uh, presumably, principally to the dark side. The other side. Uh, <laughs> as we know that there is no dark side, no, but, the far uh, side. The, the, the far, far side. side. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, right. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the, the far side of the moon is in principle, but uh, it is same as the near side in terms of its uh, extreme of um, the temperatures, the, the, the amount of sunlight, etc., that it receives. It's not until you start going towards the poles that for humans, it is going to be extremely challenging. So there, I think the way I see it is that it's going to be a human robotic partnership and that's why I was so excited by this uh, possibility of having a roving not roving um, uh, like a space station where astronauts are actually safe but in the vicinity of the moon going around it while mm -hmm. telerobotically they are actually operating instruments that are going into some of these extreme environments and actually doing the scientific measurements that humans can't do by mm -hmm. being there you know we have another question from Heather Haskins saying how much water would be required for a space station on the moon? I'm sure that depends how big the space station is, but there must be a minimum amount for making anything viable. Have you any ideas on that? Um, off the top of my head about the exact numbers, but I think if the if we go by the remote sensing data that we currently have in hand, and then do some back of the envelope calculations. Um, there are millions of gallons of water equivalent on the moon. So it is not in short supply, so to speak. Mm -hmm. and, and for a small space station, and when I talk about, I mean, this is something that I try to explain to all the visitors to Royal Society that, that why I call that living on the moon is not because I expect millions of people living on the moon. That is not my vision is. My vision simply was that if you want to explore Antarctica, you have Antarctic bases there where you know, the US, the, the UK and various other countries around the world, they send scientists, but they don't just go a day and then a week later they come back. They stay there for extended period of time. So for scientific exploration, if you want to send humans beyond Earth over a sustained period of time, then that's what I call living on the moon or could be living on the Mars, whatever it may be. Be. 
And, and for that, you really don't need a huge amount of resources, particularly water that we are talking about. I believe that there is plenty of water there to allow a sustainable exploration for, you know, uh, from human life's point of view for unlimited period of time. Well, that may give the answer to Steve R's question. How feasible is lunar habitation if water is not found on or in the surface? And you're saying really that you will find it. Um, yeah. Well, you know, it's, we, I, I'm only uh, going by the data that we have, and you can never be certain un until you touch it. And that's a very good question, actually. And it, of course, it occurs to us that um, if we don't find water, water as we know it, then how do we produce water? So there's another alternative to mm. it, which I didn't really go into that. So I just had a PhD student who finished. And some of you might have actually uh, come across her because she has been covered on BBC very, very much uh, recently. So she has been actually performing an experiment where you have components of water present on the moon. You can bring them together to produce water. Mm -hmm. So what we have shown is that half of the moon, half of the earth, half of Mars, is made up of oxygen. Oxygen is one of the most abundant elements. All you need to do is to actually combine it with hydrogen. It is going to be resource intensive, energy intensive, no doubt about it, but that is an alternative way of producing water. And we just showed that actually it is feasible. And in fact, one of the ideas for the PROSPI instrument we are building for Luna 27 is to demonstrate this experiment at the lunar surface, just like the MOXIE instrument demonstrated at Mars two weeks ago of sequestering CO2 from the air directly and then splitting it and producing oxygen. Mm -hmm. We have another question from HC Edwards. Read the far side of the moon. I would have expected that the far side of the moon might have more impacts than the near side. Is that the case or is it that thinking may show my ignorance, the images you showed seems to, to suggest fewer um, impacts on the far side. Um, I think the resolution of what I showed you was very poor because we are looking at from a distance. If you actually go in, in close up, you see the entire moon covered in lots and lots of uh, craters. <clears throat> Indeed, it is one of the characteristic features of the moon that you can identify in any picture. So, so the, the short answer is that I think lots of considerations have been given. And to my knowledge, uh, I haven't seen anybody arguing that the impact cratering on either side would be different over geological period of time. So it must be same. Because remember, we are looking at the moon <clears throat> in the vastness of, vastness of space and it's moving around relative to the earth and going around the sun, et cetera. So the impactors are coming from every direction. So I think the chances of each side getting hit is almost, almost the same. Yet the fact remains that when you look at the near side of the moon, clearly there are much bigger craters that are filled by lava flows on the far side. That is not the case. So mm. is it because of the cratering difference or is it because of the thickness of the crust being different on both sides, such that on the near side, it was much thinner, so the lava flows could come up. On the mm -hmm. far side, they came up, but they stalled. They are underneath the crust. That's what the uh, one, one of the ideas is. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't think I can answer this question, say this is the way it is. But I think based on what we know, that's, what, that's where we are. Right. Well, um, I don't have any more. Oh, wait a minute. Yes, we do. We do. When did, the, says Stephen King, asks, when did the moon become tidally locked to the earth? Has this affected the geology? Good question. It's a great question. And uh, I don't know if we have a way <laughs> of actually um, testing it to the resolution that we want, but it's right from the very beginning since it formed. The one thing that has happened is that it is constantly receding away from the earth. Mm -hmm. So um, I think at a rate of is a centimeter per year or something of that you know, order. Um, so if you imagine for four billion years ago, four and a half billion years ago, the moon would have been much, much closer to the earth than it is right now. Yeah, uh, but 
the, the same face of the moon would have been facing the earth. Now, here is some very exciting new development that has happened. Is, uh, the earth has got this uh, magnetosphere, right? So for, for a portion of the lunar cycle, the moon enters into earth's magnetosphere when actually it is not interacting with the solar wind directly because it is in the shadow, right? <clears throat> If this is happening for four and a half billion years, right? And if the moon's near side is the one that actually is being protected, so to speak, then one might imagine that if there was a way of tracking this interaction, yeah, you may be able to go back in time and say, this is when it is started. And therefore you can say that moon was tidally locked at this point. But as far as I understand, the moon got tidally locked as soon as it had formed and crystallized from the lunar magma ocean. Um, uh, here's a, I mean, we have to finish soon, but uh, another question from Heather Haskins. Is the composition of minerals on the moon similar to Earth's? That's a very important question for the origins of the moon and so on, isn't it? Mark? Indeed, indeed. And, and actually to the first order, the answer is yes and not just the elemental composition, but in fact, this has been one of the biggest findings is that isotopically for many, many elements, the isotopic composition of the moon is exactly the same as the earth, but that these two are different than the isotopic composition of Mars and the other meteorites, et cetera, that we know of. And that's where, again, this whole thing about moon having formed from the earth together with the earth, so to speak, at one point, uh, gets credence. So, so the moon and the earth have much more in common than we realize. Right. Well, I think this better be the last question, although I might have a little one of my own very quick. From Steve R. Should the moon be a single protected entity like Antarctica, for the benefit of all humanity, rather than letting countries of earth and commercial organizations carve it up into states? I, I, I think I totally agree with that sentiment and I would be very sad to see the moon uh, or the lunar exploration evolve in the way the, the way things have gone on earth. My only hope is that because space exploration is so challenging and requires so much coordination and cooperation that the default would be to, to work together how much you explore and how much you explore, there has to be a balance in that. Um, and, and I do hope that, you know, those explorers and uh, will, will be sensible and <laughs> responsible citizens of this uh, <clears throat> universe rather than being you know, driven by greed and money. Well, thank you. Just a very quick one of my own. Um, are there any water signs or signs of water or something re relating to it in lunar meteorites that have hit the earth or you know, is it, is sure. any possibility of that has sort of been um, mm -hmm. uh, disappeared by the friction through the earth's atmosphere no so so the the interaction that a meteorite has with the earth's atmosphere is so superficial that you know if if you imagine a uh, a meteorite of the size of my fist and it's, it's coming through the atmosphere. It's only the very outer skin of that meteorite that changes anything. That the interior remains so untouched and so pristine that believe me, sometimes uh, people even have found uh, things like uh, halite, like your normal salt. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you break open the meteorite and, and they have the salt very nicely preserved in there. It's only when it rains and it actually percolates through the meteorite that that salt is gone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And in fact, there has been some speculation that sometimes some meteorite could even have ice within them. But of course that will not be stay, uh, it will, won't be stable once it has arrived on earth. So no, the passage through the atmosphere uh, has very little effect on anything inside, especially for lunar meteorites, because these things are not carrying ice as such, but they have minerals in their mineral structure. You have water as hydroxyl. Mm. Mm. 
hydroxyl. Uh, yeah. And that remains intact. And that's what we, of course, we are investigating that through the meteorites right yeah. now. Well, thank you very much. Well, Professor Ennen, this has been a fascinating talk, and the questions I think could be uh, have been um, a, a sign of interest in in various aspects. Uh, which yeah, really great. Or, um, and um, I would, uh, and we we enjoyed the music too. <laughs> yeah, that was very. Um, that was very nice. Um, but I think it. Very uh, moving. I would agree. It'll be a little while before we can get moon ice into our gin and tonics. Um, <laughs> so many thanks for your detailed and fascinating talk. Um, very grateful for you to um, doing that. And a thought came to me that if and when we ever get back to normal, um, it might be possible for a small group of the friends to come visit the Open University and see physically what you're actually doing and poking and and and. Uh, 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 assessing in in your laboratories there. Excellent idea. Please do do get in touch. I'll be delighted to give All you right. a tour. We'll put that on the on the back burner for the moment. So sure. just just uh, to uh, say that this talk uh, again will be on the a dedicated YouTube channel in a couple of weeks, and our next talk uh, will be in June, and the details will go up on the website soon. So Professor Anand, thank you again. It's splendid. We've very much enjoyed your presence with us. Thank, thank you. you very much. Yeah, thank you. And goodbye right. and take care, everyone. Bye.